we're Chelsea and Tony, and welcome to our podcast, Picture This. You can watch this video or you can listen to the audio version of the podcast while you're driving or working out or something. Go to sdp.io slash podcast to find the different formats for it. Guess what? This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. Try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony and use the offer code portfolio to get 10% off. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring us. They really are the best way to make your pictures look awesome. We both use it for our portfolios, amateur or pro, or even if you're like a doctor and you need to set up a website for your for your uh, practice. Practice. <laughs> Squarespace is a great way to do it. Thanks Squarespace. That's Today, a horrible name for a doctor's office. Practice. You're right. I want like the real, I don't want practice. Yeah. I want the real Let's thing. do the real take here. Yeah. No dry runs. Okay. Today. Today the history of Canon. Uh, currently the biggest camera manufacturer in the world. They have a long history, closing in on a hundred years now of uh, innovation, some failures. They uh, overcame massive bombings during World War II. Uh, it's, it's a long and storied history, and we're going to go through every bit of it. We're going to talk about personalities, gear, what, what they failed at, what they succeeded at. Yeah, I actually didn't expect it to be as interesting as it was when you told me you wanted to do this. Yeah. And I know people are like, what about Fuji? What about Nikon? We'll get to that. If it's successful, Maybe. we'll go through them. I, mean, I really just picked Canon first because my first camera was a Canon. Lucky. 1934. So in the 1930s, the popular, well-known camera companies are German companies, Leica and Contax. And they're well-respected. They're the pride of Germany. Uh, they're known for being well-made and... That's like the camera that you get. But the problem is they were just like now they were extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so people felt like they couldn't really get the, their hands on them. They weren't really for the casual shooter with the average income. So this guy from Hiroshima, Japan, his name is Goro Yoshida. He decides to just disassemble a uh, Leica to see how they're made. Mm -hmm. So part of his job was um, fixing like film cameras and projectors. And so he was just kind of a natural tinker. That was part of his job. And he wanted to see what this camera was doing and see why it was so expensive. So he opened it up and it's just a regular camera. There's nothing, nothing fancy impressed, in there. Nothing impressed, right? No. Nothing magical in there. No, no German fairy magic or anything. No. Just... In fact, when he was later asked about why he took a Leica apart and he commented, Quote, I just disassembled the camera without any specific plan, but simply to take a look at each part. I found there were no special items like diamonds inside the camera. The parts were made from brass, aluminum, iron, and rubber. I was surprised that when these inexpensive materials were put together into a camera, it, de and it demanded an exorbitant price. This made me angry. So he <laughs> took it apart and he was like, this isn't, why is this so expensive? I can't afford this. Yeah. And it's kind of. A ripoff. Well, certainly it's not all manufacturing costs. They're probably making up for their R&D and stuff. But yeah, he decided he would make a Japanese version of that. Him and some friends, right? Well, a team yeah, of four yeah. people kind yeah, of founded it. He was funded it. by some people. I think his sister-in-law was one of the people that helped fund him. Um, but this guy, Roy E. DeLay, he tells him, like, you should build your own 35 millimeter camera. And he gets the idea to to make a camera that's made in Japan, because at that point there wasn't like a 35 millimeter uh, camera like Leica. So they kind of get together and they initially formed a precision optic optical industry company. It doesn't roll off the tongue in English, but it probably works better in Japan. And they'll change the name to Canon eventually. Just yeah. so you know, we're talking about the same company. Yeah, like we're it still is the same about entity. Canon, but it's, they went through some name changes for sure. Um, and they make this, this Leica, this, Similar to a Leica called the Quanon. It's got a W oh, in there. Yeah. Quanon. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I recall, it's named after Buddhist spiritual figure, Guanyin. I'm probably mispronouncing it, of, of compassion, basically. So it has this kind of nice spiritual history to it. That's yeah. where the, the name actually comes from. And this, this name will eventually become canon. Yeah, which I found ironic because the spiritual figure was known for compassion and mercy and then cannon sounds like uh, an item of war it sounds like a weapon yeah and it's kind of born out of like 
brutal competitiveness. Yeah. I can take these guys down. Yeah, yeah. And this battle against Leica continues on for for decades. Like this is Canon's main mission seems to be to make a better camera than Leica. And they're doing fine, but then we come into the 40s. And something big happens in the 40s. Something that is like a big deal to Japan and the whole world, and that's World War II. If you can, can you imagine being an entrepreneur? You're, you're just trying to make cameras for the everyman. And then your government decides they're going to team up with Hitler. Like literal Hitler. Not like people say Obama's like Hitler. But literally Hitler. People say that? <laughs> and so, I just can't imagine if my government suddenly teamed up with Hitler and decided to attack the United States. But that's what Japan did. And um, this really wrecked Japanese business at the time. Well, yeah, any you, that's what war does, and it must have impacted trade and materials and... So their precision optical industries is based out of Tokyo, which took the, the worst of the bombings during World War II, because the U.S. dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that's what we all hear about. But Tokyo took way more damage, and this massive, sprawling city was basically leveled. But somehow... The two Canon factories, Precision Optical Industries factories that they had going, mostly survived. One of the factories had a fire just a couple of days before the end of the war, but it was just an accident. It was like coincidental. Oh, that just must make you mad as an owner. You survive a war and then there, like some guy drops his cigarette in the trash or something. Yeah, um, but throughout, this, throughout the war, uh, they were producing very few cameras. They didn't stop. But they were, the number of cameras coming out was very close to zero. And then the war ends and the allies come in and they occupy Tokyo. So the U.S. was on the winning side of this, but Japan was actually on the losing side. And so it's not like, you know, in the U.S., businesses were happy to start up again and we yeah. were all celebrating. But they're, they're, they were devastated and they were suddenly being occupied by their own enemies. And... Canon called it quits, basically. They sent everybody home. They just closed their factories indefinitely um, because the, the Allies didn't necessarily want factories like making products and stuff. They kind of wanted to lock everything down. Yeah. And you had to go through this process to, to be able to start up a company and go back to manufacturing because they were just being run by the U.S. and the other Allies at this point. Um, so, you know, they, they're, they're touchy because <laughs> they were not happy with the Japanese at this point. So a couple of years go by and the, the people who, who were running Precision Optical Industries call back the people who worked there and they said, well, they applied to the Allies to be able to manufacture cameras. And it, it just so happens that there was a great interest in these cameras at the time, particularly by the Allied forces that were occupying Tokyo. There were basically troops in there walking around with guns who, who want cameras. Because they like cameras, but they can't afford Leicas and stuff, and they think it's yeah. a good opportunity. So they let Precision Optical Industries bring back their workers and fire up the factories and stuff. And they start manufacturing cameras again. And wouldn't you know it, Like the, their biggest source of customers are these troops <laughs> that are occupying Tokyo. Because they love these little cameras. Canon has a pretty lucky story so far. Yeah, there were a lot of businesses that did not start up again after World War II. I'm sure. And then like to it just, took Tokyo decades and decades. Yeah, to just happen to be in an industry that's appealing to the people that are kind of devastating your area. Yeah, making basically your life difficult. that version of consumer electronics. Um, but, you know, they were basically tourists in Tokyo. So, yeah, they were interested in documenting stuff. A lot of soldiers got into photography because they were seeing things they'd never seen before. Um, so they they had that and um it because they were not dealing with just japanese customers at this point they began to to take a, a broader perspective on how to deal with things and um so it's from that that they started to change the names and make them sort of more universal and it's from that that we we get the name canon so they started branding their cameras as canon yeah they're still precision optical industries but the bodies are branded as canon and their lenses, the lenses were Serenar, some, yeah. Serenar. Yeah, not a name we say because we're not Japanese and they haven't used this name for decades and decades. Um, but they're also not just using Canon made lenses. They do make some of their own Serenar lenses, but they're also using Nikkor lenses, which is Nikon's 
separate name for their lenses, a name that Nikon still uses. They never unified their names. They also developed the three self spirits. So they unified their branding and then they kind of came up with like a company mission. And, and they, they started to understand ideas behind globalization, like having these occupying forces from other countries kind of made them realize um, what they needed to do to become an international company instead of just a Japanese company. Didn't the CEO also travel to New York? Yeah, so here in the 1950s, Takeshi Mirai takes over as president. He was one of the four founders, but he just kind of becomes the actual co- president of the company and he takes over the leadership. So he's the one kind of running things. And and he's, I, I think, the biggest like business visionary that helped Canon take off. And he is very interested in this international. He was the one that was an obstetrician, right? Right. Exactly. So, That's his background before they started making cameras and glass. Yeah. So he was a doctor and then he gets into this and becomes the president. Yep. And he ended up being a really good businessman, too. Yeah, he really did. And, and he, again, kind of a miracle. He got permission to leave Japan and actually travel to the United States for business purposes. And this was not in the 50s. This was not a period of time when people were thrilled to <laughs> see Japanese diplomats in the U.S. But he managed to get permission and do this and tried to strike up a deal with Bell and Howard. And they didn't want to work with Canon because... They had wooden factories and they were afraid they were going to catch on fire again, which they already had and disrupt their whole supply chain. Because they had wooden factories. They were afraid that it was too high risk. Yeah. Wow. So he bought an old uh, Fuji Aviations factory. That's kind of jerky, right? Like a country lights your city on fire. And they're like, (laughs) we do business with you, but we notice you're catching on fire. He must have been a real patient guy. (laughs) Well, he he took the uh, criticism objectively and he, he dealt with it. He moved into a new factory and uh, presumably made out of something not flammable. <laughs> yeah, but the factory was also the headquarters. He merged the factory with the headquarters and put it all under one roof. Yeah. And that was another thing that he thought of that was inspired by his trip to New York. Yeah, so it's about this time Canon stops using Nikkor lenses and they have kind of a big lens breakthrough, which is their first 50 F1.8 which I kind of bring up because nowadays we call it the nifty 50 or the fantastic plastic, but every company makes a 50 F1.8. Canon actually makes a couple and it's one of the first lenses you buy because you can take like good portraits with nice background blur, but they overcome some technical challenges, which are like massive amounts of flare when using that kind of wide aperture. That's something nobody had really done before. So they now have this novel piece of glass and, and it's the glass that's going to start to, to lead people to use their cameras. And that's a, a trend that we see continuing on for Canon. This is actually learning about um, Canon competing with Leica is making me understand why some people still value Leica so highly. Because I'm younger, I didn't grow up in the generation that heard their parents talking about Leica being like the apex camera. Yeah. And having... I don't know, having a Leica now, it just seems like a matter of taste for me rather than, oh, they own the best camera. They have a Leica. But I can see how that name, that brand has still carried some weight for a lot of people. Yeah, they were the innovators and Canon mm-hmm. for a long time was just chasing them. And in fact, in 1954, Leica introduces the M3. That's how they named their cameras. And the viewfinder is bright and crisp. The rangefinder, which you use for like focusing, is is very precise and it's all amazing. And they get this camera in at Canon and at the other manufacturers, camera manufacturers, and they're astounded by it. Really? Like they're actually taken aback. Like they saw the earlier Leicas and they thought we can do better. They saw this camera and they thought we need to come up with a different plan. Ah, oh, so they can't see. Well, that's the thing. When you're a copycat, you're always chasing someone. Right. When you're an innovator, you get out ahead of the game and let everybody chase you. So Canon stops thinking like a copycat and they start thinking like an innovator. Yes. And they do continue to make range finders. But this is also when they start the development of their SLRs, which are single mm-hmm. lens reflex, reflex cameras. Most of their cameras nowadays are that. They have a little mirror in them and a viewfinder lined up with the lens and the mirror bounces the light up to your eye. And it's a design that really hasn't changed in whatever 50 60 years it's been um so they they still continue to make some range finders but at this point they start to make cheap range finders they decided we cannot make a better camera than this leica m3 which is high flattery for leica yeah they just gave up they're like plan b 
Okay, so they're kind of doing R and D for these things. Yeah. In 1957, they they make this brand, this logo, which you probably recognize because hasn't changed. It has not changed. I gotta say, it's pretty timeless. Yeah, but 60 years timeless. <laughs> it's. I I think the logo is still fine. Yeah. Um, but it's remarkable because if you look at Pepsi or Coke or Nike, all these companies constantly have little variations in their logo to modernize it. Canon just locked in because I think tradition is really important to Canon. Yeah. So at this point, not only are they doing R and D, but and trying to develop new cameras, but they're also branching out. In '55, they open a branch in New York, and then after that, they open their first branch in Europe and Geneva. Uh, so they're not only gaining popularity in Japan, they're kind of establishing this world presence. As we jump forward just a couple more years to 1959, now they release the, the Canon Flex, which is the Canon's, Canon's first SLR. And it's kind of in the name because we call it a single lens reflex camera and the reflex uh. refers to that mirror. So Canon Flex, that's just the, the origin of the name. And um, it's, it's a success, it's their first SLR, but people like it, and you can still pick these up. The Canon's very first SLR, you can go to eBay now and grab one for 50 bucks. Sometimes a little bit more, depending on the condition, but so it's kind of cool. Not that, rare. No, they're not rare? No, they're not rare at all. It's cool that you can go back and, and still pick up these cameras, and a lot of them still operate to this day. Um, and as we fast forward to 1961, now that inexpensive rangefinder comes out, the Canon, this is their Leica for the every man <laughs> oh. and these you can pick up on ebay for 30 bucks so they must have been pretty popular at the wow, same time that must have been successful canon also tries to make a makes a higher end rangefinder camera called the canon 7 and the way they differentiate this is is with the glass basically they make this lens that is still amazing it's a 50 millimeter f095 for this rangefinder, it's just like this massive block of glass, and it's super heavy, and the depth of field is razor thin. We have like a, a modern version of this made by a different company. And we also have autofocus and zebras. <laughs> yes, exactly. We have all these facilities, yeah. and rangefinder cameras are actually really difficult to focus because it's not linked up. Yeah. Like you can look and focus with your eye, and the lens itself won't be properly focused. Anyway, um, those lenses today. Will cost you twenty five hundred to thirty five hundred dollars. Wow, so it's a beautiful lens, though. Yeah, just to give you some sense for for how things hold their values. Cameras completely lose their value. Lenses, lenses actually hold on for a really long time. Our five hundred millimeter is what eleven years old, but still worth as much as the day we bought it. Worth more. Yeah, than I the bought day it we for it. well, I bought it for sixty five hundred, and I could probably sell it now for six k after oh. eight or nine years. Yeah, that seems like. Fine. Yeah, pennies a day, really. Yeah. The Canon, the cameras that I've owned for eight years, you might as well just toss them in the trash. <laughs> and the cell phones you've owned for eight years? Yeah. <sighs> Nothing. Lenses hold on to their value. <laughs> they just they just don't age like anything else. I wonder how that would compare to a Leica. Same age, same era. What oh, those they... Leicas are completely outrageous. Yeah. Right. Those Leicas don't actually lose value. No, those are still very expensive. Yeah, if you look up like a Leica M3, you're probably paying several grand for one of those today. And people will still be out there using them. 1965, another minor development, but uh, Canon releases the the Pelix. And I mention it because it it's sort of an SLR. It's got that mirror in there, but it's a fixed mirror that is semi-transparent. So the mirror doesn't move out of the way when you take pictures. Oh. and the upside of this is you can keep looking through the viewfinder while you take a picture. So the viewfinder doesn't go dark, which is cool. Um, the downside to, to it is that semi-transparent mirror blocks half the light. So you basically lose a stop of light. So you're using ISO 400 film instead of ISO 200 film. That kind of, so it, it's a bit, bit of a drawback, but the, this design, we still see it today. Like Sony has fixed mirror cameras today in their A-mount camera series. So that design has also held around for a really long time. So 1971, we're starting to get more into the modern era and Canon begins creating cameras that, for uh, like professionals. And they make what will eventually become like their one series cameras today. The, oh, like they kind of use like the Tesla model. Oh no, the opposite actually. They started really affordable and then they tried to get in the pros. Yeah, exactly. So they mass produced first. 
Right. And then they're building to this like uh, more exclusive market. Yeah. And in a way they're still kind of taking on, on Leica, but they're, they're changing games now because now they're going for like sports photographers and they're kind of eyeing photographers who are taking pictures of the Olympics, Yeah, which is not really like a strong point. Um, and they released the, the F1. It's designed to be fast, well, as fast as a camera back then could be <laughs> with a little say. thumb crank on the back of it. Yeah. Um, but it, it's good for 100,000 exposures, which means the shutter won't break. That used to be an issue. They would just wear out, oh. um, which is like 2,800 rolls of film. And here's an interesting thing. They, they promised not to change the design for 10 years, which is unusual, right? That's not something we see today. Apple's not like, here's the new iPhone 7. We promise we're not going to update it for 10 years. Yes. <laughs> no, that would be Ooh, terrible. Predictability. Um, but for professional <laughs> photographers who are investing in a system, this was really comforting to them. They knew they were going to have the latest camera for 10 years. And they also knew that they could invest in all these interchangeable lenses. Oh, okay. So I, I thought this was interesting because this is still sort of uh, key to Canon's success today is this sort of, they innovate and then they stabilize. So they make like a leap forward and then they just let everybody enjoy it for a while <laughs> before they make another major change. And that's different from say Sony who's got a new body out every day and they're changing systems and it can just be hard to keep up with it all. Canon is still That's funny, really stable. <laughs> that one got Justin. <laughs> uh, Justin today is laughing because we had a crisis with a Sony camera, the latest and greatest Sony camera that just decided to just burn out and stop in the middle of recording. It overheated, right? Yeah. And that is the downside to this sort of rapid innovation. That's fun for a consumer who loves gadgets. Yeah. But for a professional who's being paid, who needs to get the picture of the Olympic gymnast, mm -hmm. you can't go back the next day if your camera freaks out. You need something that's stable and reliable. And that sort of like long production cycles are, are really good for that type of photographer. The F1 introduces a new lens mount called the FD lens mount. And they, they stuck with that lens mount up until their modern lenses, the, the EO system, which takes over. And the FD lenses support auto exposure which basically means the camera can like control the aperture on the lens, but there's no, there's no autofocus or anything. Just having auto exposure is a big jump at this time. Yeah. It's not just completely manual. Yeah. Up until this point, you're dialing in the aperture on the lens itself and then dialing in the shutter speed on the camera itself. And some cameras will have a meter inside of them. So you can like see if you're overexposed or underexposed, but you still have to like manually, it's decoupled. You basically have to manually dial it in. So it's a big step forward, this FD lens system. Chelsea, let's take a second and thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes, uh, I, I'm not really as good at reading about Squarespace. They make are, beautiful websites. They do. And I can tell you my own personal experience with Squarespace. It's, it's really easy to set up. As somebody who did web development and continues to do some web development, it's a pain. You're dealing with plugins and they're free, but then you have to pay for them and things are incompatible. And then somebody updates one component and it breaks everything else. Can I just tell you as someone that doesn't know anything about web design, um, other things are also a pain. Squarespace is very, very easy. Yes, Squarespace <laughs> makes all that easy. It's just it's one less thing you have to think about. All you have to do, you can think about taking pictures and making your pictures look good. And then you literally just drag and drop them in there. They have beautiful, elegant designs that work in any browser and work on people's smartphones and tablets so you don't have to worry about mobile compatibility. And when the next new iPhone comes out and has a bigger screen, they'll make sure that it works for that too. You can just think about taking pictures and Squarespace will make them look great. We talk to all sorts of people who set up Squarespace portfolios and they just love it. If you want your own, go to squarespace.com slash Tony for a free trial, 14 days, no credit card required. And then if you decide you like it, if you want to stick with it, use the coupon code portfolio and you can get 10% off. If you're curious what they look like, well, you can go to Squarespace and see samples. You can also check out our portfolios at chelseanorthrop.com and northropphotography.com. Thanks, Squarespace. Thanks. We get into the 70s, 76. So at this point, they're competing with Minolta, right? Mm -hmm. And who else? Still Leica. Yeah, Leica's in there, uh, Nikon Pentax, is in there, Olympus. Pentax, Olympus are making yeah, yeah film cameras. And this is when they come out with the camera I think a lot of people know, which is the AE-1. We have one of these. That's right there. Oh, 
We have it right here. The AE1, the AE stands for auto exposure. Auto exposure. And dang. Sure, the F1 had auto exposure, but this is a camera for the everyman. And as you tap that, it's plastic, right? Well, yeah, because they wanted to make it more affordable and lighter. Mm -hmm. This was a consumer level camera. So they tried to make it look like it was high quality by putting this uh, thin metal veneer, but it's all plastic. And if you feel it and scratch it, you can see it's not solid. Um, but that camera has held up pretty well. And I've shot with that camera. It still works just fine. Um, it its auto exposure is only shutter priority. So there's no aperture priority right now, <laughs> but uh, you can set the shutter speed and then the camera will adjust the aperture on the lens to give you decent exposure. But this was wildly popular. They had a popular oh, yeah. um, advertising campaign and then they went on to send sell over a million units. This camera took off. Yeah, they're practically free on eBay. <laughs> you can buy a bundle with a couple of lenses for like 50 bucks um, because it's just everybody had them. And you're right, they they marketed them really really heavily and they took those same awesome fd lenses that canon had been producing for the pros so you had this wide variety of glass i have a big telephoto on there that's sufficient for like portraits and wildlife and stuff um and people really started to get into photography and also kind of like collecting different gear so this was the camera that that made people more serious hobbyists basically yeah the ae1 was really a landmark camera a lot of people watching, either that was their first camera or it was their dad's camera. <laughs> we had a Minolta. Oh, you're a Minolta house, huh? We weren't even fancy enough for Canon, which was the like a bargain brand. In 1981, Canon does what they promised, which is they update the F1 camera, like finally. And it's not that noteworthy, except it just they really did wait 10 years to update the camera. And then wow. after 10 years came out, they, they kept it almost identical. <laughs> they made almost no changes to it. Um, it. Externally, it was exactly the same. So photographers could buy the new F1 to replace their old F1 and feel comfortable with it. And that's the, I bring it up because that's a trend they still do today. When you buy the 5D Mark III, it's almost identical to the 5D Mark II. You buy the 1DX Mark II, it's almost identical to the 1DX. Yeah. And that, that's clearly a value that they hold, like making things backwards compatible for your muscle memory <laughs> making them comfortable to the people who already use their existing gear i think that also just make it more affordable to them to not have to recreate all the molds or whatever yeah I, I think there's some economy there yeah. too um but it's it's almost anti-innovative whether it's a good idea or a bad idea they could be redesigning things all the time if you can well Actually, I was going to use car makers as an, ex as an example, but Porsche almost does this with the 911. Like you look at the 911 body styles, it it's almost exactly the same as it was yeah. 50 years ago. But most car manufacturers don't do that. They reinvent the wheel each time and try to make something super cool. I wish some would. And some need to, right? They need to just stick with the old stuff. Um, so 1982, Canon again steps up their marketing game and, and um, they take out the first photography ads by Canon and National Geographic using this tagline, wildlife as Canon sees it. And they, they market this really heavily and they start to get people who are interested in nature into photography, start to bring in people who are doing wildlife photography and selling some of this high-end glass. Anyway, I bring it up because I, at the time I was reading National Geographic and these ads really stuck with me. I'd look at this big glass and I always wanted it. <laughs> so I imagine other people were kind of doing the same thing. 1984, um, the the president who'd taken the company through so much, you can say his name better than I. Oh boy, you're setting me up. Matari Takashi? Yes. He dies this year. I just wanted to note it because he was so important to yeah. the company. Uh, Canon also introduces the T70, which has got to be one of the ugliest cameras ever made. I was just going to comment. <laughs> it's so we have to ugly. Put it, we, we write a blog for the people that listen. We write a, a follow-up blog so you can go check out the pictures there. Whew. Real ugly. Yeah, how would you describe that? First, it could only be made in 1984, <laughs> right? Yeah. It looks, there's something distinctly 80s about it, and it has this awful LCD display on the top, like Casio watches that were popular really at the time. It's really plasticky looking. Which Canon is still using. <laughs> anyway, it, it was a common camera, but I just wanted to say this was the first case of us seeing the LCD display in the cameras and uh you know 30 years later canon is still using that same so a few display years basically later 87 and they introduced the 
EOS system. The right. EO system. Electro optical system, but also kind of named after the Greek goddess of dawn, EOS. So it's one of those things where the acronym happened to be something meaningful. So did they, they just ran with it? Yeah. I do that. Um, and the EOS lenses are still what we use today. They've not changed that lens mount. Um, it's been more than 10 years. It has been more than 10 <laughs> years. <laughs> they really stuck to it. And that's also key to Canon's successes. They've stuck with this lens mount for so long. You know, it's, it's coming, up, coming up on 30 years that they've been making compatible lenses. The EOS lens mount brings in autofocus. Which, if you can imagine, people were not, they didn't have autofocus so before. So they, like, pioneered the this. They innovated this. Uh, no, there were lots of camera manufacturers making autofocus cameras. Canon was actually behind at this point. Canon. Um, partly because they didn't want to change their lens mount. Their existing lens mount wouldn't support it. Oh. Now, Nikon made a different choice. Nikon has been keeping up the same mount for even longer. Um, they did something a little bit different. They just keep making little modifications to their mount, and they put uh, the focusing motor in the body. And even in modern cameras, Nikons, they will have a focusing motor in the body. And there's like a little linkage that con connects to the lens and drives a little gear. And Canon made a different strategic choice here. They decided they would scrap their old mount and make a whole new mount, which requires making a whole new series of lenses. It was a big deal to make this EO system. But they thought it was important enough because they needed those electrical contacts to communicate with motors inside the lens. So it seems like a minor technical point, but it ended up being like a defining moment for the company. Because when you start over with a lens system, that's a big deal. That means everybody who has all your Canon gear, they, they can't upgrade it. They have to set their existing cameras and lenses aside and buy something new. And that means it's an opportunity for them to go ahead and switch to Nikon or something. Because once you buy into a system, you know, yeah, you not, buy a camera and a lens. You're not married to the system anymore. If you have to start over, you could go to anybody. Yeah, right? You tend to upgrade one lens, and then you upgrade one body, and then you're, like, locked in. So they released everybody from the FD lens system and said, hey, buy into this new, new system. It was a huge gamble. Um, but in hindsight, it's a gamble that paid off because the new lens mount is, I think, the best lens mount of all the camera manufacturers, partly because it's not as old as the Nikon lens mount. Nikon's lens mount is kind of small, and whether or not bodies have this mechanical linkage in them is still kind of a confusing point to some customers. Like if you get the Nikon 50 millimeter F18D, it is an older mount and it requires the body to have this mechanical drive in it. And not all the Nikon bodies do. So if you buy a low end body, you won't be able to focus with it. And if you buy a new body or a high end body, you will. So you, you have to understand you have to get the 50 millimeter F18G to autofocus on those. So anyway, it, it gets confusing. More confusing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All the Canon EO systems, they, they just all autofocus and they have lots and lots of capabilities. And so in the long run, it really paid off for Canon because they just had a better mount. And they introduced the EO650, which is their, their first EOS camera. Also available, <laughs> super cheap on eBay. Also really also pretty horribly ugly. ugly. Yeah, it's like 80s futuristic design. <laughs> you expect like uh, pastel laser beams to be drawn <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Okay, so 1989, Canon introduces the first EOS One. Oh, it's starting to look more like a Canon. Oh, this looks exactly like our modern cameras, yeah. doesn't it? Like very slight changes. This is their EOS version of like the F1 series, the top end camera for for sports professionals, and um, they're really looking to go after people shooting sports. So it's it's very fast. The focusing system is four times more sensitive than. Uh, the EOS 650, so it'll focus down to EV minus one, which is still pretty good. Uh, these these one series bodies, even when you use them today, you're like, eh, focus is really good. nice, yeah. even though it's so old. Um, has a variety of metering modes and stuff, and they they also introduced the EOS RT, which is a version of it with that sort of fixed mirror, which has those same benefits, like no viewfinder blackout. In 1990, I just want to mention Canon introduced the EOS 10, which was meant to make photography more simple because people had a hard time with the settings and stuff. So what you could do uh, is it came with a little booklet and it would have like a, a portrait or a sports picture. And then you would scan a barcode with the camera and the camera would then dial in the settings from the barcode. Oh boy. 
Just like all the modern barcode scanning cameras. That is some cameras. wacky stuff. I know. It was a huge flop. Nobody liked the barcode scanning I, camera. Can you imagine how offended our viewers would be if there was a barcode system for taking pictures? Yeah, and, and people really did kind of find it offensive. <laughs> um, and people don't like it when camera manufacturers make photography too easy. That's one thing I see, too. There's always a pushback. No, there's a difference between making something easy and dumbing it down. Yeah. And that's dumbing it down. Yeah. Um, 1991 was a notable year, and I think a lot of us will remember this, but this is when they came up with the Rebel brand. <laughs> and Justin remembers this. I do. Yeah. And who's the biggest rebel you could think of? You're probably thinking of somebody who overthrew a government or who stood up for like civil rights in the face of tyranny. No, Andrea Gassi. A tennis player who was rebellious because he wore the hair at the back of his head longer than other professional tennis players. That's why he was a rebel? Was, yes, he had a mullet. He had a mullet? <laughs> and that's about it. That's and they came bad. up with this, even at the time it seemed ridiculous. Uh, this like so late 80s, early 90s thing where he's like tearing off his shirt and swinging his mullet around. <laughs> and then they're like, rebel. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Why don't we have a clip of that? What is the image of a rebel? <laughs> oh my god. We need to send this to him on Twitter. Look at him without his shirt on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Driving around gosh, in his Jeep. He looks like Zach Morris. <laughs> <laughs> Peering over the sunglasses. Oh no! That was too cool for me. I know it's technically happening in the 90s, but that's still the most 80s thing I've ever seen. Can we just figure out how to say Andre Agassi first? Because this is really bothering me. I think you're nailing it. I think you're right. Should we redo the whole Andre Agassi thing? Since I don't think we, we, we possibly him can. Andra Agassi, Andre Aggie. I think you just did it. I completely butchered his name i'm sorry you are an icon of <laughs> photography and tennis a hero and a true rebel yeah we're really sorry about that on the aggie <laughs> uh so aggie 1992 <laughs> comes along and canon uh well of course this is a technology we all rely on today. i just want to see all of their commercials now i stopped <laughs> caring about this presentation i need to watch more of that i controlled autofocus so you can pick the focusing point with your eye. Just look at the subject. The camera reads your eye, just like we do in all the modern cameras today, right? That was a huge success. I was just going to say, I already know how that worked out. <laughs> yeah, you just... it flopped. <laughs> By any chance, did this come out around the same time as Terminator? <laughs> uh, probably so. Anyway, Canon tricked me on this one because I was a, a young nerd at the time. <laughs> when I bought my first oh, camera, yeah. the next generation of this, the, the Elan 2E, well, they had the Elan 2, and then for like 100 bucks more, you get the Elan 2E. And the E had the eye control autofocus. And, you know, you'd be reading Pop Photography magazine or something, and they'd be like, eye control autofocus is amazing. It, it was terrible. It never worked, and apparently they never figured out how to make it work. I just imagine you trying to like, you know, when something doesn't work and you really tap your phone, I imagine you with your eye being like... <clears throat> Oh, you would? You would? Yeah, your eye would be all wiggling around and people would think you were just being really weird. You'd be like, hold on, I'm trying to change the autofocus point. Oh, this is photography now. <laughs> uh, uh, that would yeah. explain why everything was focused on, never mind. 1995. You know what? I just want to say I looked it up. Terminator is way older than I thought. 1984, the original Terminator. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. 1995, a Canon technical innovation that's actually with us today, and that's image stabilization. Dang, they And it did was it. a really big deal. And this was another thing that made me get into photography, because Canon was the only one with stabilized lenses. And This made you get into photography? Into, well, it made me, one of the reasons I selected Canon. Oh, Canon. Because I was into wildlife photography, and this was their 75 to 300 IS. And the IS is image stabilization. And it meant you could handhold pictures without them being all blurry. That's and a, that was kind of a big deal. Plus. So I matched that with my Alon 2E, with the eye-controlled autofocus. Canon also releases, and 
updated EOS 1N with the fixed mirror again. And this thing was super fast. It could take 10 frames a second <laughs> with, yes, yeah, standard uh, 3D6 exposure film. So, About yeah, done. three and a half seconds, oh. and you've time to pop off that back and put on another roll of film. Film's expensive, man. The year 2000. What happened? Uh, here, Canon releases the D30. And this was another sort of breakthrough, because this is kind of the first SLR, digital SLR that people can sort of mm. kind of afford. It's three grand, so it's actually not that affordable. But it's way cheaper than other interchangeable lens digital cameras. Because up in, for the past few years, people have been tinkering with digital cameras. And I can speak from my own personal experience here. All my, a lot of my nerd friends had some crappy little digital camera. And you'd, you'd look at the pictures with amazement because you could see them on your computer, but the pictures themselves were terrible. So I was still shooting with Mylon 2E and I was scanning film to get them on the computer and setting up websites and stuff. But people were beginning the shift to digital. So this D30 started it all. It was the first digital SLR. Um, I also think that this is one of Canon's biggest technical mistakes here because they made a choice. They, they made their sensor APS-C size. That's still a term we use, referring back to uh, like the advanced photo system, which was a smaller than 35 millimeter film format. Yeah. And they made it subtly smaller than the Nikon and every other APS-C sensor. They gave it a 1.6 X crop. So it was like, instead of a 1.5 X crop that everybody else went with. So in other words, it was like 12% smaller than everybody else's sensors. And for some reason, they just decided to go with a slightly smaller sensor. But as a result, the image quality from the year 2000 until now on these cameras has been 12% worse than Sony and Nikon. Mm -hmm. And to this day, we listen to people complain all the time about how Canon image quality is worse than the other competitors. And according to my math, almost all of it is because the sensor is slightly smaller. So this one choice that they made with a, for the D30 in 2000 still kind of sticks with them. But Who's they were the, responsible for that. <laughs> they were the first ones with this very innovative innovative camera. It was almost exactly like a film camera. It just had a tiny little screen in the back. What was your first digital camera, Justin? Do you remember? <laughs> it's actually the same thing I have now. It's the Pentax uh, K200D. Mine was a Vivitar. It had like one pixel. It was really, <laughs> really bad. The screen was terrible. You, you know when the, the digital screens are so bad and so small that you can't even, it's like overly bright or something, you yeah. can't even really see what's going on? But yeah, this seems pretty nice compared to that. Uh, one of my Bob friends had a Sony <laughs> Mavica. My Bob friend. <laughs> and uh, this monstrosity of Tony a Sony digital camera. Tony has two friends camera. named Bob. Now he just calls them his Bob friends. And it actually took those uh, like three and a half or three and a quarter, three and a half floppy disks. And no. you put this big floppy disk in it so it was shaped like that. Or no, that's not right. It was burning a CD. It took an entire CD. It was a ridiculous shape like that. You put the CD in and it would spin it and it would actually burn your pictures to the CD. Wow. I know. It was so I'm silly. I'm so glad I didn't have to witness that. And you used that? Well, I got to play with it, but. One of the Bob friends had it? Yeah. 2005, Canon releases the 5D. Hey. It was what we started our stock photography business with, but it was also a landmark because it was really, even though it also cost, it cost $3,300, it was still considered affordable because it was a full frame. So it was finally replicating the field of view of 35 millimeter film because with all the affordable SLRs before they had that crop factor, a little sensor. And, but they didn't have APS-C lenses at the time. So people were still using regular full frame film lenses oh. and it meant nobody could shoot wide angle. So your 24 millimeter lens was a 24 millimeter lens. And finally you get film like results because up until this point, shooting digital had been a huge sacrifice. So, uh, we, we, well, I ended up buying the camera, I think before I met you, but it was the first camera where I really felt comfortable, like switching over from shooting film and scanning it. And three years later, 2008, Canon releases the 5d Mark II. Also a huge innovation because this one had video. And this was a it's milestone. though, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it had HD video, which was a big deal in 2008. 
And it was the first camera to really have video. It also meant it had live view on the back, which was a big deal. Because uh. now you could hold the camera up and see the back of the screen in, in real time. And this started the DSLR video revolution. It started a lot of people getting into filmmaking. And it's what got us into YouTube. Because we had this cool camera. Now we could make decent quality videos without having to buy a separate video camera. People were using it to make TV shows and movies. And suddenly every camera manufacturer had to start thinking about video too. And the reason was you could use these awesome 35 millimeter lenses with their shallow depth of field and get those effects for video. And that sort of effect would have cost you tens of thousands of dollars before. So the 5D Mark II, really a, a huge step forward in, in filmmaking. And at this point, this is kind of where the major Canon historical breakthroughs end. I know well, for now, I'm for now, gonna... I, in the next eight years, I could come up with a list of things that, you know, Sony and Pentax and Olympus and Panasonic have done that would be historically noteworthy, but Canon, not so much. My I theory, like, I think that Canon likes to just lay low and be quiet until they have something that they think is really big. Right. I think we're in that lull between the F1 and the new F1. <laughs> I think they're doing lots of innovation and they're going to spring something big that will leap them back ahead of everybody else. Well, when we went to the Canon Expo, I was really surprised by all the other technologies that they were working on and how amazing they were. The uh, 8K projector. Right. Um, and then they had incredible... Like 120 megapixel sensors. No, 250 200 oh. or something like that. Yeah, ridiculous it megapixels. insane. And then they also had those beautiful prints. They're working on printers that are just incredible. Right. To the point where you think, I mean, they had them in a display that looked like a window. It looks like you're looking at a window because they're massive and they're incredibly detailed. So they have a ton of technology and I'm, I'd just be surprised to see what their next big thing is for the camera world. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting. There's almost a juxtaposition. Like Canon is almost what Leica was in the thirties. And now Sony is like Canon. Right. And now yeah. everybody's trying to catch up with Canon. And if you ask somebody Sony. who's been into, well, no, everybody's trying to catch up with Canon because they have the biggest market oh, share. Oh, I see what you're saying. And so you have companies like Sony who's trying to do it with innovation and you have Pentax who's trying to do it by making less expensive cameras with similar feature sets. So you're and wondering everybody's who's shooting at the, Canon. Who's who's going to be the next one to come out on top? Yeah, or will Canon manage to maintain their lead? A big part of the reason so many pros love Canon now is because of their stability. Because they know those one cameras are going to work every single time because they have this massive library of lenses because there's no fussing with the new technology. It it simply works. And that's our experience well, with the Canons I'll too. I'll also say, I think that they tend to not change, but I also think a lot of people get comfortable in their habits. And if you learn on a particular brand, then you know the menu system, you know where all the buttons are, you understand how to use them. It's just, you don't have that newness that can kind of be disorienting when you're learning a new system. Yeah. Um, at the same time, after a period of time that starts to look outdated. So I think if you took somebody who grew up with their smartphone yeah. and showed them that you needed to use a Canon DSLR, they would think it was so silly antiquated. and antiquated. <laughs> and so I do think they are ready to make that next jump. Need, I hope it's soon. They started to with the touch screens and things like that. Yeah, they have been making incremental improvements. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, we do two podcasts a month. Who should we thank for making all this possible, Chelsea? Uh, we need to thank Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. So try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony, and you can use the coupon code PORTFOLIO to get 10% off. And even if you don't want to buy it, you can get 14 days for free, no credit card needed, just try it. Try it before you buy it, or try it and don't buy it. Squarespace. <laughs> <laughs> try it and don't buy it. That's a great tagline for them. Whatever. Thanks for making it possible, Squarespace. Uh, tune in next time. Like, share with your friends, and subscribe. Thank you. Thanks.